This is a summer's tale. We journey with Amy and Sam as they explore the course and the history of a little river in Staffordshire. This river, the Sow, rises in peaceful farmland near the Shropshire border, as it has done since the dawn of time. It meanders today through some of the loveliest, most unspoilt countryside that you could ever wish to find, until after 20 miles or so, it's lost in the River Trent. Over centuries, these peaceful waters and wooded banks have borne witness to the evolution of a small part of rural England, from Stone Age through conflict and civil war to the arrival of a motorway. We start our journey as Amy and Sam find just where the sow first bubbles up out of the ground. Since much of the river flows through private land, we were most careful to ask owner's permission before any exploration could begin. underlying themes are inexorably linked to the course of the sow, the influence of successive bishops of Lichfield, and the events of the English Civil War. Mr. Henry Butter had farmed around here for many years. Oh, hello, Mr. Butters. Then used to smelt iron down here and this is the residue if you look around there's lots of these pieces of iron stone all around this area covering about an acre and I was very puzzled what they were because I farmed here for about 40 years and then one day I found some bits of pottery like these you see and I took them to Handley Museum and to have them dated and they date from the 13th century See that one? You see the where it's melted. Yeah. The men used to beat the molten ore with big hammers and then get the iron out. Mr. Butters, what were they using the iron for? They'd use use the iron for the for probably making tools and the tips of plowshares. This is all that remains. It's all that's left of the men who worked here 
700 years ago. The woods above provided fuel for the charcoal ovens to melt the ore, and damming the river provided power to hammer out impurities. Here, by the south, were the three essentials for medieval ironworking, ore, wood and water. Come on, Sam. Flowing down a beautiful wooded valley, after a mile or so, the stream reaches Fair Oak, where it trickles under the road and then on into the Langat Valley. Well, it goes from the hedge, it's, it's, uh, it comes under from there. Mm. You know that hedge that we saw with the river, it goes down there and under the road and, and along here, and there it is down there. Nearby, a great clump of trees stand on top of a rocky mound. According to local legend, in pre-Christian times, Druids are supposed to have conducted ancient sacrificial rites here, on the huge rock at the summit. Come on. Even on a fine summer's day, the sound of wind in the trees and flickering shadows on the rock make it quite possible to believe that this tale might just be true. It was nice to be back in the sunshine again. The first day had been an exciting start to the adventure. Half a mile from Fair Oak is the little church of Broughton with its fine peal of bells. Its old box pews are some of the very few that still remain in this country. Jim Oldry has been verger here for over 60 years. These are the original pews that were put in the church in 1630. They're all Jacobean and they're all made out of local English oak. The panels, as you see, are raised with what we call a bolection mould, round each one. And uh, I suppose these at the back might have been for the Broughtons themselves, the higher ups. In the year 1820, there was a, what they call the Broughton Band. And uh, they were up in the gallery there. There was uh, a flute to hall, a big bass fiddle and a wonderful and fearful instrument called the serpent. 
The font is uh, what they call the holy water stoop. And I, I was told that it's a Roman origin. But whether that be correct, I wouldn't know. But it is most unusual, being so high from the floor. The stained glass over the altar at the east end is also of considerable interest. The four figures are not as one might at first suppose all the patron saints of Britain, Andrew, George, Patrick and David, because Patrick is undoubtedly of French origin. He is in fact St. Roche, who is, as he is so often depicted elsewhere, pointing to a plague spot on his lake. Adele's brought ancestor was known to be in France at the time of Cressy and the Black Death in the mid-1300s. Whether this glass is war booty or merely a memorial to St. Roche is a matter for conjecture. Across the road is Broughton Hall. During the Civil War, the young heir to the Broughtons, a staunch royalist, was shot dead by a parliamentarian soldier. There are tales hereabouts that from time to time, his ghost wearing red socks still haunts the hall. Um, this is the room where Red Sox allegedly died. Um, we know that he was shot in the window at the far end of the long gallery. I'm for the king! Um, he crawled along here. Unfortunately, it took two days to die, this is what we were told. And he crawled into this room. We believe this was his room because it was the only panel room. He was the heir, the son and heir, so he would have had the best room. Um, I personally haven't seen him, but I have spoken to people who have. But I believe that he's a very nice little ghost. He's a noble ghost. And the people who have seen him haven't been um, worried or upset. In fact, I think he's, he's someone I would like to meet. The next day, Amy and Sam continued their journey along the south, down the Langut Valley. The ancient British word Langut means holy stone which lends some credence to the Druid legends. Local folklore has it that during the Wars of the Roses, ten knights slain at the Battle of Blore Heath in 1459 
were buried around here on a small knoll facing the river Sau. Several possible sites are investigated, but nobody could tell us for sure where their resting place could be found. But it was fun looking. As many as six stonemasons once worked quarries here, and to this day the local inn is called the Freemasons' Arms. The children were also hot on the trail of the Duke of Buckingham's legendary cave, but more of that later. Bishop's Wood, at one time the property of the Bishops of Lichfield, lies to the west of the valley. Mighty Oaks once stood here. I bet you, Amy, know your belief how big these are. So I'll put a coin on to show. Okay. The Queen's heads are not going I know. Well, the M6. In Those great trees had provided fuel for the ironworks along the Sau and later the Huguenot glassworks, remains of which can still be found deep inside the wood. Yes, it is. I'm glad you found this. You said that when we found the source of the river Sound. Yeah, I'm glad we find everything really because they're all hidden. Mm -hmm. that, I think they would have a blower thing that would go through there, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Yeah, have a roof over there. And I don't really know what that hole's there for, but I know what those um, round circles are. Crucibles. Remaining crucibles. crucibles. crucibles I, yeah, the remaining of crucibles, which they put all the stuff into. The ingredients. Yeah. I found some. Um, that's Your name special is this painter. Sandstone. Your name is this painter. Yeah. Well. She had some of that sandstone. Yeah, and, and she said it was the in, some of the ingredients for it. And I just found some down there. Joan Painter of Croxton has been fascinated by this place since she was a little girl. She showed us some of her finds. Look, I used to go potato picking, and um, as it brought the potatoes up, it brought all this broken glass up with it. And uh, I wore a bag around my middle and used to put it in, carry it home, which I thought was treasure. But when I was a little girl, about six, seven, walking into the wood to pick bilberries, there used to be huge pieces of it. People had them as doorstops, and I wasn't interested particularly then. These are parts of crucibles. There were large containers, like huge buckets, uh, which they put the minerals in to make the glass. This is a pebble covered with glass, and it has either been part of the manufacture of the glass or dropped the glass onto a stone and it had encased it. The chop cut that many trees down that uh, it was forbidden, I think, to cut any more. So they couldn't use the wood for glass making and they moved on to other parts. Comparative peace and quiet reigned in Bishop's Wood after the departure of the Huguenots. That is until the middle of the last century, when it is said that a murder was committed around here. A local farm labourer by the name of Higginson, unable to continue to support his son, took the lad one day, possibly even down this little lane, up into the wood, to a grave which he had previously dug. 
and cruelly did away with him, with his shovel. It is said that the boy was buried while still alive. Just into the woods. Higginson ultimately confessed to his crime. He was executed by public hanging at Stafford in August 1843. According to contemporary news reports, a special train comprising upwards of 30 carriages arrived at Stafford as early as 7 a.m. The number of people from the potteries in Newcastle was immense, it being supposed that there were between 20 and 30,000 present. It seems hard to believe on a fine summer's evening, as one contemplates this calm river valley, the long periods of silence broken only by the sound of sheep, cattle, and the occasional skylark, that seven centuries ago, it was so heavily industrialized. Once there would have been the sound of saws and of falling trees in Bishop's Wood, the clang of iron workers' hammers and the crash of tumbling stone in Fair Oaks quarries. In the Wars of the Roses, the sounds of battle would have rolled up the valley from Bloor Heath, and much later would have been the clatter of horses' hooves and the shouts of parliamentarian soldiers searching vainly for a fleeing Duke of Buckingham. What tales this river could tell? Near Blawpipe Farm, the sow's trickle becomes a stream as it turns eastward through the pipe under the road. After the Royalist defeat at Worcester, the aforementioned Duke of Buckingham, a Colonel Blague and several others sought refuge with one George Barlow at Blawpipe Farm. Their fleeing king, Charles Stuart, had entrusted them with the safe custody of his Diamond Order of the Garter, known as the George. With their pursuers closing in, Barlow hid the jewels in the farm dung heap. Not a moment too soon, Blake, a Lord Leviston, Mr. Marmaduke Darcy, and Mr. Hugh May were all captured shortly after leaving the farm. But Buckingham escaped. Sam conducted a hopeful and thorough search for the jewels, but to no avail. Their retrieval had been masterminded by no less a person than Isaac Walton. He smuggled them into the Tower of London, where Colonel Blake had been imprisoned. Incredibly, Blake then managed to escape to France and returned the George to his monarch. Staffordshire historian Tobias Churton told us something of the undercover intrigue of those times. Well, so nobody escapes from the Tower of London unless they're helped. <laughs> yeah. And I think by, in 1651 you could guarantee that the number of royalist uh, sympathisers in London was huge. And there was a network. This clearly 
indicates there was a network mm -hmm. of concern. And what is interesting is that, is that Walton's involved with that network. Mm -hmm. Then we have a letter that somehow survived. Can I read the letter? Yes, yeah, sure. To George Barlow of Bloor Pipe Farm. Sir, tis known in London that Colonel Blake hath secreted in your house, when you received him after the fatal fight at Worcester, the lesser George of the Garter, of gold and diamonds belonging to the king. And there is much talk here of a commission being given to a troop of horse. Does Walton go to Bloorpipe Farm? Yes. He does. And he can no, guarantee... He doesn't, does no, he doesn't. He doesn't, no, he doesn't. seem to. Cut, cut, cut. Well, no, no, no. But he, <laughs> but he gets very close to Bloorpipe Farm. He gets to Stafford. He follows sure. with the messenger, but he doesn't go to Bloorpipe Farm because he knows that this group of troopers are coming up from London to grab the jewels. Yeah. Now, how they knew about it, who knows? So it's a desperate rush, the yeah. last wheel of the movie kind of thing. Before we left the historic Langat Valley, we heard rumours of a possible set of standing stones in Bishop's Wood. Gertie Norton, retired headmistress and Joan Painter, told John Darlington, borough archaeologist, where many years ago they'd both seen evidence of such a stone circle. You saw? When I saw, what I saw was that, mm. and I know I saw at least two stones, and, and as Uncle Harry had, had spiked the ground, to, you know, and we could have found more, I suppose, if we'd have stopped it. What colour were they? Sandstone? Ordinary, ordinary, like our ordinary stone, um, right. rocks. Yeah. Mm. Right. How big were they? Well, the one I saw, I think, as far as I can remember, because you remember I've had a war since then, I, was, <laughs> I went down to Kent, it was about that wide, well, that long, yeah. and I went roughly about this wide, you know, too big to be a house stone. Oh, they were. Yeah. Yes, because we got stones in the one end of Westview. Or, or, or part of a furnace. I mean, I don't, I'm just trying to no. think what it could be. I think. Yeah. It wasn't that sort of. It didn't look that sort of thing. It looked like like simple it, it, things. Well, I thought at the time, and I've always been interested in these old things. I thought that it was like part of a furnace. Mm. Mm. Because from what Uncle Harry said, he'd seen more of them, mm. in, in, and they went round. They brought a map showing the location as they remember it. The site is now to be investigated. Amy and Sam were now confident that they must be close to one of Buckingham's hiding places. It's outside. It's out of the bank. Just down there amongst those trees, like. You can't see it for the trees. It's the first house down there. There used, to, there used to be a ladder in at one time, and you could go down in it, you know. You used to have a ladder down there. Good many folks have been in it. Would you still go in it today? I don't know. <laughs> it has to ask the, I forget her name, what's her name? She'd let you go, she's a nice person. Thank you very you. much, Mrs. Bailey. Well, it's a pleasure. Bye. 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 <laughs> they found it at the Outlands, just down the road from Bloor Pipe. It goes back about, I mean, you, I could disappear and sort of, and have sort of two feet in front of me. And it's about, oh, four feet wide and two feet high, that sort of size. It's very dry, I mean, there's just nothing ever goes in it. It feels quite warm, actually. I suppose you'd scramble out every now and then. And <laughs> <laughs> but apart from that, I, yes, I mean, you could, I know you don't know, I suppose the area was all wooded then anyway, yeah. so it would be... Um, I mean, that's the natural wood on the other side, and I guess it was all wooded like this at that stage. Probably with a track running through the valley or something. After his narrow escape, 
the Duke had disguised himself in the clothes of a woodman named Matthews, whose descendants lived here until quite recently. They worked osier beds between the house and the river, from which they made baskets, very popular with the local pottery industry. Buckingham spent some time in the Langard Valley, hiding in various caves, the Freemasons' arms, and once, it is said, even in a bread oven. He continued to evade capture and eventually rejoined his king in France. The river winds on eastwards until it flows into the tranquil waters of Offley Pool. Well, it is when you go carp fishing, it's a two or three day job. Because you, you know what you're after, you're specialising in that one type of fish. The mill here still grinds corn. In 1866, just here, at the bottom of the hill, a chain of events started, ending with one man's brutal murder and death for another on the scaffold in Stafford. Early one January evening, John Poole, a railway worker from Croxton, set off for home from this house, then the Four Crosses Inn, where he had been drinking, apparently quite amicably, with a chance acquaintance, one George Bentley, who was in fact an army deserter. Bentley had noticed that Poole had quite a lot of money in his purse, and after a little thought, he decided to follow his inebriated late companion. Overcome by the cool night air, Poole had slunk down by the roadside near Wharf Mill, where Bentley caught up. Having robbed Poole of his money, the vest from his back and the boots from his feet, Bentley put on the stolen clothes and repaired bloodstain to the Royal Oak in Ecclesall to drink his ill-gotten gain. 
recognised as a deserter, he was arrested by the local police sergeant Robinson, and he confessed to his brutal crime the following morning. Bentley was hung at Stafford Jail on Tuesday morning, the 27th of March, 1866. Contemporary reports stated that a large but smaller than usual crowd and very few from South Staffordshire witnessed his execution. How many passers-by in this lovely place, we wondered, know anything of the fatal events played out here on that lonely January night nearly a hundred and thirty years ago. <laughs> Don't dry up. The sow flows on into another pool at Wark Mill, dating back to the Doomsday Book. Why was it called Wark Mill? Mr. Jakes of Sugnall Hall explains. I haven't got any idea when Wark Mill actually started being a mill or was engaged in the preparation of cloth or whatever it was. Is there any idea about that? Uh, well, the, the only real, real record we have is the date over the door of the mill, which is, what, 1831 or 1830 or something. And that was presumably when it was made into a a grinding mill rather than a fulling mill. I, I, I a mill for the grinding of, of, of corn, corn, yeah. Corn. yeah. Um, but before that, obviously, there, there would have been a mill there because we have the name Wark Mill, which uh, you, you tell me is to do with the clock industry. Well, yes. From my records, in the Middle Ages, the first written record was about 1357. Cloth, after it had been woven, had to be finished off in a mixture of fuller's earth, ash and water, which was trodden or walked underfoot. Hence the name Walk Mill. The cloth was shrunk and cleaned, ready for sale. It's mentioned in the Bible, Mark chapter 9, verse 3. And in his raiment was white as snow, so as no fuller on earth could whiten them. Later on, I presume, uh, they harnessed the um, waters of the River Sow um, to, to power a trip hammer to take the place of the workers' feet. talking to old Vernie Marsden. I don't know whether anybody remembers Vernie Marsden, 
But um, we were having a drink in the star, and he says he can remember when he was a boy uh, cleaning out the warp mill pool by barrow and spade. in the great storm of January the 6th. Um, the, the ruination now is, is quite incredible and I don't think that you could ever properly repair it again. I know that's what the historical society wanted to do. They wanted to, to repair the mill and they wanted to buy the, buy the farm as well, so, and the farmhouse, um, so that they could uh, off, offset the cost of restoring the mill by uh, developing the rest of the land, which I suppose, I don't know, in this day and age... It's the way of the world. It's the, it's the way of the world. I'm sure it'll be uh, opposed by the CPRE and probably other, other people. Not far from Walk Mill, the Sile flows on into the broad and beautiful expanse of Cockmere. Roy Wint, a local naturalist and photographer, loved this spot, as indeed he loved the river that feeds it. His collection of colour slides on the course of the sow helped us plan our journey. Swinging left, the sow trickles through the water meadows at Pershall, towards Eccleshall, under the Loggerheads Road, passing to the north of the town.
When we reached Eccleshaw, we found it to be all in bloom. My 
jobs in jeopardy. <laughs> there we go, the beers. Next. Oh, yay! Oh, yay! Oh, yay! Oh, yay! Welcome to Eccleshaw. God save who? God save the Queen. God help me. There we are. Wonderful. Well, I think we have to go into deliberations now. Don't forget the hat. If you want to get ahead, you've got to get ahead. <laughs> Eccleshall's fine 13th century church is the burial place of no less than six bishops of Lichfield, who for a time resided at Eccleshall Castle. Traditional form of giving a blessing. That's how they used to do it, traditionally. Oh, okay. That's right. Yes, the bigger that is in Crosby, isn't it? Uh, it's a bit, a bit old fashioned, which it isn't usually done now, except by vicars with a slightly old fashioned bent. Now, I come into church to lock up, and I, it's, 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 dark, it's a bit dark, and I look at this and wonder if the ghost of the bishop is sitting here, watching me. <laughs> I don't suppose he is. Yes, there goes in Well, one of the first things people often ask when they come in is, how old is the church? Mm. Well, to give an answer, I tell you that these 12 pillars all the way around the church uh, were being built in about the year 1180. Now, I don't know how good you are at maths, but you'll work out that's just over 800 years ago. And we had our 800th anniversary just a few years ago, and we had some wonderful celebrations here because, of course, 800 years is quite a big thing to celebrate. Mm -hmm. But have a look at these pillars when you're looking round because each one is different. At the top of each pillar, you'll see different patterns. Uh, and there's a very interesting one at the back because it's got the faces in it of three oh, yeah. stonemasons and they're called the three young masons and everyone looks at that because 800 years ago they put their faces there upon that pillar and then another hundred years went by and they pushed the ceiling up higher and put those windows in and that's called a clear story or some people say clara story I'm not sure which is right but you hear both words used, uh, and that was put in then. So that tells you how old the building is. But actually, there was a church here long before this one. We've got some fragments of stone at the back, which we think came from a Saxon church, which is probably a thousand years old. Uh, and there was maybe even a wooden church here before that. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you how we know that. 
because the name of this town, as you know, is Eccleshaw, which means in Old English, the church by the stream, or the church by the marsh. Now, it was called that before this church was built. So there must have been a church here, mustn't there? Mm. Uh, so really, people have been worshipping on this site well over a thousand years. You can see, if you look behind you on that back wall, where the original roof went. That's how it used to look when it was first built. Amy and Sam attend the Lonsdale School in Eccleshall, and when the headmaster heard about their research, he agreed that some of the school should join in. themselves in actually uh, expeditionary work, field trip work, to do with the river sand yeah. with, a, with a dear old gentleman called Roy Wendt. Yes, Roy Wendt. But we have a river which flows right through the area where we all live, including Eccleshaw, which is why I call it our river. Which one is it? Leeds. The South. The River South. And that now Roy came into school and showed a lot of slides and really motivated the children to learn about this river and to learn about the river and, and the river and its community, so to speak, rather than the community and its river. Mm. And he was so excited about the, the project himself that this rubbed off on the boys and girls. So you got nine and ten year olds following Roy went around the Sow and looking for this and showing where the river had moved over the years and so on. Here's where it used to be and now why do you think this has happened and this part of erosion and why do you think this... And the questions that were raised, and he was so enthusiastic that Mrs Hilton and the class gained an awful lot from it and made, at that time, a wonderful exhibition of work about the River Sound. But it was mainly thanks, I think, to Roy Wendt's enthusiasm. Obviously, he's sadly gone now. She gives me kisses when I look sad And somehow things don't look so bad He lives in a world Where there's no passing time When I was young, that world was mine But I've seen a lot of places I've done a lot of things I lived in a low world Full of trips and of kings And I played for the aces I met the jokers around 
At Eccleshall Castle, the present owner, Mr. Mark Carter, told us something of its turbulent history. Uh, a number of buildings on this site, probably the early ones were timber, um, and uh, the Danes came indeed up the rivers, they came up the Humber and the Trent, and then up the River Sour, which comes close by, yeah. and Eccleshall was sacked several, several times, in particular there was a big raid in uh, 1010, um, and uh, so, uh, it really wasn't until after the Norman conquest that anything uh, was reconstructed, as far as one can gather. But of course it all appears in the Doomsday Book then. The first civil war to, um, to occur in our country was not the one between the Roundheads and the Cavaliers, but the one between the Yorkists and the Lancastrians. Mm -hmm. And that is the well-known local story where Queen Margaret supposedly reshot her horse at Muckleston and fled here to Yes, that's correct. Oh, well, because the reason for that is she, she was here before the battle, uh, and probably with her King Henry VI. And this, in fact, she was using as a base. That's our understanding. And she was here as the guest uh, of uh, Bishop Pals, or Hales. Uh, and uh, when she heard of this uh, Yorkist uh, force moving down, she decided to go out and intercept them. And she had to hurry back in some disarray afterwards, of course. Formidable uh, lady. That's another story, yes, indeed. And I believe that it's basically the model of Shakespeare's Macbeth, a Lady Macbeth. Really? Mm-hmm. Charles I comes on a tour, and he seems to have visited the castle as the guest of Bishop Wright. Charles the First. Mm-hmm. That's wonderful. Um, and possibly bringing his son, Charles II, with him um, as a boy. But, uh, of course, Bishop Wright uh, becomes prominent in the time of the Civil War because he was a close friend of the King. In fact, he spent most of his time actually in London rather than in the diocese. And uh, at one time he was uh, told by the Archbishop uh, that he was uh, neglecting the diocese and he ought to do something about it. Um, so he hurried back here. And uh, he was in residence at Eccleshall Castle when the Civil War broke out. And Staffordshire declared for the king, did it not? Um, well, Staffordshire, like most of the country, was a, a bit confused as to who it was declaring for. Um, mostly for the king, yes, I think that's fair to say, but uh, there, there were a number of families who had declared for Parliament. And the Governor Mannering family from Whitmore, uh, who had been in Whitmore a long time, uh, they certainly were Parliamentarians, uh -huh. and they made themselves unpopular by going around uh, 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 bombarding their neighbours' houses. Really, <laughs> <basically>. <laughs> um. So ultimately, at, at what particular date uh, we, we, we have to picture the, the castle under siege then? Mm -hmm. uh, when was this? Um, General Brereton arrived here 
with the Parliament forces in uh, May of 1643 and besieged the castle using the uh, early Trinity Church as his base. And with his guns, I, uh, it seems to me, set out on what's now the cricket pitch. And uh, the castle was too strong, they couldn't get in. Uh, but uh, of course the um, royalist forces and the bishop inside uh, couldn't get out. So uh, things in the castle became increasingly uncomfortable. The guns were bombarding it, which is largely why there's nothing left on the south front um, to speak of. And uh, that state of cellmate continued right up to August, when the parliament forces withdrew suddenly. Uh, in fact, they, they went to take part in the skirmish uh, near Stafford, and the um, defenders mistakenly thought they'd gone for good. In the meantime, the elderly bishop had actually died uh, within the castle. He was 83 by then, so uh, he lived to a right old age, but the siege was finally too much for him. Um, but with the uh, parliament forces withdrawn, the defenders came out, and they... Um, <clears throat> regaled themselves in the uh, Royal Oak, which was there in those days, and other hostelries uh, in the uh, town. Um, and the bishop's funeral was arranged. But unfortunately for them, uh, while this was all going on, the Parliament forces returned. Oh dear. And uh, most of them were cut off from the castle. There were a few defenders left in. The bishop's uh, coffin was sort of abandoned halfway to the church. Um, and uh, even so, the uh, very strong castle uh, was beyond the parliament forces to get in. But there were, and it was held by only nine defenders, yeah. finally. Um, until they got some information, I think, uh, out of one of the they captured soldiers. Um, and found out that they were, were so lightly defended and they launched a night attack and got in then um, and then it was all over and the castle was sacked. Well, it's a gap of about 50 years. 50 years. Yeah. There was some use made of it. The corner tower that's remaining does seem to have been used as a prison. As a prison. And, uh, and royalist synchronizers were locked up in that for a time. Um, the, Gifford, the member of the Gifford family uh, from Chillington, uh, was in there, so his successor, who's a contemporary of mine, is always rather apprehensive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and there was Lady Wolseley supposed to have been in kept in there. I didn't know what she was doing in here with the bishop, but anyway, <laughs> uh, history doesn't relate. Um, the last bishop to live here was a Bishop John Lonsdale. Who uh, gives his name to the Lonsdale School. Indeed. Yeah. And he's buried in Exeter Churchyard, among others. Um, and his successor, Bishop Selwyn, um, who spent a lot of his life in New Zealand and uh, also Selwyn College, uh, named after him, um, he wasn't much in favour of these sort of houses. And uh, also, well, it, it is true to say it's too far from the cathedral. Um, and he decided to sell it, although they've still got the large part of the estate, which went with the house in those days. Um, and uh, that's when. Uh, the bishops decided to move uh, back into the cathedral. That was uh, into the cathedral close, mm. and that was in 1867 or 70, some date of that sort. And there was a church commission. Thank you very much indeed for talking to, to me, Mr. Carter. Um, we hope we can use, but well, for all the information you've given us, that we can use on our. Thank you very much. Sure, yeah, well, it's nice to have had you here. You know, and I, I've lived in here and in the area all my life, so anything of, lo of local interest is of interest to me. <laughs>
to few. So I have responsibilities. Well, maybe you're using your brake. Will you just stop being tailgater? This fine white house, Hilcote Hall, once the home of the Noel family, featured in more recent history when it played host to the Soviet leaders, Bulganin and Khrushchev, when they visited Stafford. See this little window here? When this church was built, nearly all the windows would be that size. The church would oh, maybe before 1066, maybe 900, they would put a little church here, but there was no glass. And so the windows were that very small like that, and shuttered inside and outside. Now as time went by, technology improved, they, they learned how to, to carry the weight of a window down a central beam in the middle, and to put a big beam across the top, flat topped and that's a sort of decorated gothic maybe Victorian style but that looks like decorated gothic window that on the other hand the small one is a Norman or a Saxon window one of the original windows in this church and you can see how the arch has been interrupted cut off halfway across as they put this new window in there a two box church just the, this is where the people sat then you'd have a screen across there and that would be the choice another little window Right now, all these other windows, all these big windows.
To the east of Chebsey, near the River Meese, just before it joins the Sow, is Isaac Walton's cottage. to take you into the 17th century my time. We are going to step backwards through time and we are going to arrive in the year 1644. And another step back. Another step back. Another step back. Another step back. And another. And we are going to arrive in the year 16. Now, it so happens that in my snapsack, I have this Orlo. John. Orlo. Emma. <laughs> Orlo. Learning all about the, the, the period of Isaac Walton yeah, and how things yeah. were done. We need to find out what days are on, which, which activity is on which day. Um, but yeah, book in advance is always a good idea. How much is it? It's five pounds a day per child. Okay, and what are the hours? It's 11 till 4.30. Uh, at two o'clock we've got a visit from King Charles. Uh, <laughs> should we go? We're going to dress up nicely <laughs> for that. We're going to dress in our fiery for that. This gentleman here. I still do not understand what is going on with your shirt. Oh, and the boots are mighty fine. Yes, you're most smart. But I was always afraid of prisons anyway, whilst being on the run. Although he wrote several biographies, it is for his book, The Complete Angler, that Isaac Walton is best remembered by most of us. A book with hidden depths, perhaps, as Tobias Churton explained. Writing about God, but to experience the divine. So the complete angler has, has that, and it also has a political message then, doesn't it? A very clear political message. Uh, even uh, the last words of the, the, some of the last words of the book are study to be quiet. Yes, study it's, to be quiet. It yes. sounds like the most inoffensive, innocuous statement certainly that any radical government uh, could wish to hear. They'd be very pleased to know that uh, former royalists were off fishing and, and being quiet. But what he's actually saying, and you read through the book, is contemplate the waters. Time will heal the situation. These, the great tumult that is going on, the ranters, the ravers, the, the levelers, all the, the, the social uh, breakdown of the country will be short-lived. And the truth will be re-established once more, not because they want it to be, but because it is the truth. This is the essential spirituality of Isaac Walton. It's what is the case? The nightingale breathes such sweet, loud music out of her little instrumental throat that it might make mankind to think miracles are not ceased. He that at midnight should hear, as I have very often, the clear airs, the sweet descants, the natural rising and falling, the doubling and redoubling of her voice, might well be lifted above earth and say, Lord, what music hast thou provided for the saints in heaven when thou affordest bad men such music on earth? After a difficult trek across a large field of sugar beet and through dense undergrowth, the children eventually found the next place they were searching for, the meeting of the rivers Sow and Meese. What 
river is this one that we're in? Oh, uh, this is the other river meat. Wow. From here, the river sow grows in size, arriving in a mile or so at Great Bridgeford. Sometimes I think I know What workmen do to know Cause I can This was to be journey's end for Sam and Amy. It had taken them ten days and many miles on foot and bike to get this far. Holiday time was over. It was time to say goodbye to the river they'd come to know so well. And as they left the sow, they knew it could only be au revoir. Before another summer came and went, the sow would draw us back again and lead us off towards the train. What? Cool.